So this is Operations Research Map 317, Lecture 10. And so I thought about whether or not I wanted to do something again, and I decided I will do it. Uh, I'm going to show a big theme that if you have an optimal solution, you have a basic optimal solution. What do you think the proof is going to be very similar to? Yes, essentially. What's the, going to be the different ingredient that we're going to have to include now? The minimization. The minimization, right. Somehow the cost function should enter. You know, we didn't need to have that enter when we were dealing with just basic feasible, but if we're trying to find basic optimal, at some point the cost should enter somewhere. Now, one of the nice things about recording these lectures is that I can actually check and see, so how the hell did I do this lecture last time? And so unfortunately, the last time I gave this lecture was a very happy day. It was uh, one of my favorite holidays, but it's a holiday that often falls on a variable time, and some years there is actually no iteration of this holiday. It is Yankee Elimination Day. So the, the day when the New York Yankees are eliminated from winning either the division, the playoffs, the World Series, you know, that's not going to happen. Hopefully, not until a little bit later from now. But it does bring up an interesting question. In sports, how do you determine when a team is eliminated? What's the simplest way people determine if a team is eliminated? Yeah. Uh, if, uh, when I like the hint, yeah. <laughs> no, this is how you want to do yeah, it. Yeah, yes. so um, basically if there is, if there is like a, a minimum threshold number of wins they would need to cross to make the playoffs, if there aren't enough games so that if they won every game you added that to their current they wouldn't cross. Good. So often you look, you know, can we catch another team? And let's assume that team has the worst possible season from this point on, but it loses every game, and we win every game. Can we get above them? And if the answer is no, then we are eliminated and we can't catch them. What is the greatest baseball season of all time? No, not 2006. No, 2007 was a good season. 2004, email me for extra credit. Yes, 2004 was the greatest baseball season of all time. And why am I mentioning this in a linear programming class? Because the websites miscalculated the elimination numbers. What they did is they just looked at if a team loses all the games and you win all your games, can you catch them? What are they ignoring? They're ignoring that if a team above you loses all of their games, some other teams must be gaining wins. And so in 2004, they actually had the Red Sox clinching a wild card berth one day later than they actually had, because there were two teams in the American League West. One of them has to win the American League West, and the Sox just have to do enough so that neither team can catch them for the wild card. If both teams won out, they could catch the Red Sox. But one of them would have to win the American League West, and they had three games against each other. So this is where you get to use some great math principles. If they have three games against each other, one of them is going to get a loss. In fact, one of them is going to get two losses. So the question is, how do you actually calculate elimination numbers when you now have to take into account team versus team? And there is a great website, I don't know if it's still up, which does this by doing a linear programming problem and looks at all possible schedules. And so this is another application of stuff we're doing. It normally runs the calculations around you know, 2 or 3 a.m. Eastern time, figuring by this point there should no longer be any games going on. Because it does take a little bit of time to go through depending on where you are in the season. All right, so what is the theorem we're going to do today? We're going to start with if there is a... Let's make sure I'm in focus. Nope. So we will start with... Theorem, there exists optimal solution for a canonical linear programming problem, then there exists a basic optimal. So the proof should be very similar as before. So we'll assume, you know, AX equals B, x is greater than or equal to 0, and we'll assume c transpose x is minimal. You know, that's what it means to have an optimal solution. Now, we can assume additional things about x. 
what might you want to assume about x? So this is just to repeat what we did last time. No zeros? What do you mean by, so no zeros anywhere? Well, no zero columns in A. Oh, okay, so we will assume always that A has no zero columns. So this is now gonna be part of our expanded definition of you know, linear programming. We're not gonna include variables just to make someone happy, right? If I wanna come up with a model for how the school committee should allocate funds, and my daughter really wants me to include um, the number of times the Loud House is aired on Nickelodeon each night. I can put that into the formula and I'll weight it by a big zero. But I can say, look, Kayla, it comes into the formula. Uh, my son Kim would probably also support that. So we will assume that A doesn't have any zero columns. What can we assume about the vector X? Is X basic? Yes? Um, all the zero entries are at the end. So we could assume that we can always adjust our notation so that the non-zero entries of x are in the beginning. But if x was basic, how hard is this to prove? It's not that hard. So without loss of generality, assume x is not basic. So you always want to give yourself extra structure to play with. You know, if x is basic, it's trivial. So let's assume x is not basic. As was suggested, we can shuffle our labels so that the non-zero entries are in the beginning. And then we're going to do the same argument from before. We're going to do a minimality argument. Assume has fewest non-zero entries all at the start. So really, at this point onward, we don't really care about anything in A beyond the first k entries. So we'll have you know, x1, x2, dot, 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 xk are greater than 0, others equal 0. There could be many things that have the fewest number of non-zero entries. We just take one of them. OK? And then the goal is to get a contradiction. So the goal, find something with fewer non-zero. Or there's another contradiction we could get. So one contradiction is we could have something with fewer non-zero entries. What's the other contradiction we could get? Less cost, or something with less cost, right? We have two different ways to get a contradiction now. We're assuming we have an optimal solution, so if we find something with a lower cost, it clearly could not have been optimal. So this is the case we now need to solve. So the argument is going to be very similar as before. Since x is not basic, what can we conclude? So x isn't basic, what does that tell us? So if you're basic, what does it mean for a solution to be basic? Yes? Good, those problems are literally independent. So since x is not basic, they're not. So that implies there exists alpha 1 through alpha k such that alpha 1 a1 plus alpha k a k equals 0, not all alpha i equals 0. I'm going to try something new. I'm going to try actually just putting this in front of me. How long did it take me to think of that? All right. So this looks very similar to what we did before. What does it mean to be in the column space? It means you're a linear combination of the columns. This is a great way to look at what linear algebra is doing. So now we can study x2 
which will be x minus t alpha 1 through alpha k. So looks very similar to what we did before. This is a really great idea. This method of proof is terrific. This idea of descent, it's a really good technique. It's worth seeing it twice. Is this still feasible? Does A x t equal b? Well, when we apply a, we know a of x equals b, and this will give us just t times a on that vector. You probably notice I'm kind of careless about writing vectors as columns or rows. You know, I'm not worrying about that. But when we apply a, we know that when we apply a to this vector, it sends it to zero because that's what it means to be not basic. We chose alphas. So the answer is yes. So we still have a basic solution. What should we look at now? We look at the <coughs> set of alpha i's that set the linear combination to zero, and then try to find a column that we can remove. OK, so one possibility is to try to find a column that we can remove, and then we can play the game as to how much can we move. So clearly, we're OK if t equals zero. Because if c equals zero, we're subtracting nothing. And then the question is, can we increase t a little bit in either direction and still have something with positive coordinates? Yes, because everything in x has positive coordinates. You know, I'm only really looking at the first k components here. So if you want, I should really pad this with a bunch of zeros. In the interest of notational simplicity, let's just remove those columns we don't care about. Since everything in x is positive, doesn't matter what these numbers are. You can choose a t sufficiently small such that this difference will still be positive. So there will be a region of t that's OK. So OK for some region of t. t let's equal to some bound b. And we talked about last time about how you could figure out what that bound is. It's possible that the bound is infinity. Unlikely. And in fact, we know at least two of the alphas have to be non-zero. So because of that, we'll actually know there is some finite number. And so if you go to a certain point, you will get a new coordinate becomes zero. And then everything else will become positive. So we can change t to decrease the number of non-zero coordinates. Have we proven the result? Do we now know that this is a contradiction? Wait, how can you change t to decrease the number of those? Well, just the same thing as before. You know, imagine that the first coordinate of here is 5, and this is, that's a tough Let's say the first coordinate of this is 10. So it's, you know, 10 comma dot 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 minus t 2 comma dot dot dot. If I take t to be 5, that will now cancel this. If I had negative 2, if I take t to be uh, negative 5, it would then cancel that. So I can always increase t to kill at least one coordinate. Is this enough to prove? We yes. We still don't know whether this is still optimal. We don't know if this is optimal. See, what we were doing last time was much easier. We just wanted to show that it was feasible. Unfortunately, this might not be optimal. What do you think should enter the proof right now? The cost function, right? You know, the cost function has to enter at some point. And the problem right now is we don't know if this is optimal. So what's the new cost? Well, it's going to be c times xt. We'll take the dot product. So you'll get c transpose x, and you'll get minus t times c transpose alpha 1 through alpha k. And again, I'm being a little bit careless with the vectors. We'll assume we reduce things, so we're only working with k components. Now, when you look at the new cost, the new cost is a function of t. Alpha 1 through alpha k is fixed. This 
is just some function of t, and this is fixed. So the change in cost is just negative f of t. So what we can do is we can vary. Now, there are lots of different functions you can play with. You know, one of the nice things we do in the faculty here is we visit each other's classes. I was visiting a stat in 101 where they put down you know, the function of the standard normal. And this is not a function you want to integrate. Fortunately, we don't need to integrate it. We can do tables and whatnot, but that's not an easy function to work with. This is a function of t. Is this an easy or a hard function of t? If I double t, what happens to the new cost? How much does it change by? Two. Two, or whatever this is. If I quadruple t, it's a factor of four. You have a dot product, which is just some constant number. So it's just t times a number. So let's just say it is t times, what number would you like to use? Any favorite letters? I'm sorry? Q. So just t times q. So what are the possible values of q? If it's zero, then it's. Okay, no, so, so I'll, I'll ask that in a moment. What are the possible values of q? I mean, it could be infinite, but positive, negative, positive zero. negative, or zero. And then as I change t, I could have q, 2q, 3q, I'll stop there. So which case would you like to analyze first? Positive, negative, or zero? Negative. negative, OK. So case one, if q is less than zero, what should we do for t? What do we want to take t to be? It's got to be negative if you want to decrease the cost function. Right? Well, if you take t to be negative, you would increase the cost. Subtracting t. We're subtracting t times q. Q is negative. So we want t. Oh, sorry, sorry. Q is negative. We have negative, negative is a positive. Yeah, sorry, you're right. We want, t, I, yes. we want t to be negative. So if q is negative, take t less than 0, cost decreases, contradiction. Great. What case should we look at next? Yeah. If q is greater than 0, yeah, I'm not even going to write it. It's the same argument. So the only case that's left is if q equals 0. So case 3, if q equals 0. Well, if q equals 0, what's the new cost relative to the old cost? Same. same. And now we can run the argument we did before. The problem with the argument we did before was we didn't know that we stayed optimal. Question. How would you just take t less than zero? How do we know like, that would still satisfy? Like, what if there isn't a t over there that's less than well, zero that would make a non-t? Well, that's the whole point, is because all the coordinates of x are positive, and all the coordinates of alpha are finite. So let's say the largest coordinate of alpha is 1,000, mm -hmm. and the smallest coordinate of x is 1. Then if I take t less than 1 over 1,000, it's still going to be large enough here to be that. You can just take t to be so small that it essentially has no contribution. So think of t as 0, then it's going to be positive. And then t goes up just an ever so slight amount. It's still going to be positive component by component. This is the genius of looking at basic solutions. There is so much we can do with the structure and again, this is why we like the canonical. So for the positive and negative q, we're not even caring about trying to get one of the columns Correct, to zero. correct. So the work we did before to show that we could get a column to be 0 is not needed in case 1 and case 2. It was fine to do it. You know, we have it as a fact. But it's not needed. Because we have multiple ways to prove, um, to, to get a contradiction. We can get a contradiction by getting something that's no longer optimal and then that violates that, or we can get something that has fewer non-zero components. So what does Q actually represent? So Q is C transpose alpha. OK. It's just, it's just a real number. OK. Gotcha. And so the whole point is, in general, it's very difficult to tell how things change as you move. 
And if I go from one solution to another, one feasible solution to another, how does the cost change? But because we're moving in a very special way, we go from a vector x to x minus t alpha, we can figure out exactly how the cost changes. And the reason is the cost function is linear. So when you have terms linear programming, it's kind of good to get a sense of where these terms come from. Programming does actually not come from computer programs. I was shocked when I learned that. It's not from actually coding things. It actually comes from the terminology the military used for different problems. And that's where it came from. The earliest papers in the subject are from the early 1900s. And they are filled with wonderful comments such as, you know, this is a beautiful subject and a beautiful theorem. Unfortunately, it's for all practical purposes useless because you need to solve systems of equations with like 100 variables. And so, you know, times have changed. You know, there's lots of great quotes on how much people have uh, incorrectly estimated what the future would be. You know, there's maybe a demand for five computers in the year. You know, lots of great stuff like that. And so initially, these were just theoretical results. And then people found a way to do things efficiently. And with computers, they could actually then run the stuff. But the linear comes from the fact that we have linear constraints. We have linear objective functions. If you change the constraints from linear to quadratic, all bets are off. And we no longer have efficient, fast algorithms. But similar to how linear algebra can do things quickly, we can do things quickly here because of the word linear. So this is the proof. Same cost, fewer components. Contradiction. And that finishes the proof. So again, the proof is extremely similar to what we did before. All right. So what I want to talk about now is a small little detour to just give you a sense of how happy we should be at various results. What we now have is if there's a feasible, there's a basic feasible. If there's an optimal, there's a basic optimal. We just have to search the space of basic feasible solutions. Is this enough to be excited about? How big is the space? Can we go through it efficiently? Can we find it? It is too much of a detour to prove how fast the simplex method runs. So I'm not going to analyze that algorithm in full generality. What I want to do instead is talk about some other problems that seem very simple and give you a sense of just because something is finite does not mean it can be done in a reasonable amount of time. And just give you some appreciation for how difficult these things can be. So the first is, you know, as a number theorist, I love what kind of numbers? Primes. So what is the oldest theorem you can think of about prime numbers? They're infinitely many. They're infinitely many. Copyright has expired thousands of years ago. <laughs> we are free to just use the theorem as we want. But who should we attribute this to? Euclid. Euclid. So normally, Euclid argues as follows. <coughs> there exists infinitely many primes. Proof. If not, P1, P2, Pn is all. That's all the primes. So consider P1 times P2 times Pn plus 1. So well, you should know what a prime is, just to make sure. Primes are numbers that are divisible by precisely two distinct numbers, themselves and one. Composites are divisible by at least two primes. And what positive number have we ignored? What positive number have we ignored? Yes? One. One is a special category. One is a unit. It is not prime. You could define one to be prime. You can define anything you want. It would be bad. Actually, I think I sent you something about the polar magnetic derivative of primes. So you can redefine prime numbers. And if you want, I will get you that paper to look at. OK? It's not a good idea, typically. You know, things like this that have lasted a couple thousand years, that's probably a good definition. It's probably a good way to look at things. Not guaranteed, but probably. You know, Einstein showed us that we were wrong in how we were looking at space time. So you can be making these mistakes. The reason we don't want one to be a prime is we want every number to be represented uniquely as a product of prime powers. And if one is a prime, then I could write six as 
1 to the 2019 times 2 times 3. It seems absurd to have to deal with something like that, so we don't let 1 be a prime. So we consider this new number x. Case 1, x is prime. Contradiction. Right? Because we assumed that this list was all the primes, so if x is prime, then that list was not complete. Case 2, x is composite. Well, if it's composite, it must be divisible by a prime. If we divide this by p1, well, this whole thing here is a multiple of p1. What's the remainder when we divide by p1? 1. one. What's the remainder when we divide by p2? One. Same thing for all the primes. So if it's composite, that implies there exists a new prime p not equal to p1, p2, dot, 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 pn, dividing x. And that's also a contradiction. And that finishes the proof. So there are infinitely many primes. This gives you a terrible growth rate of how many primes there are up to x. It's extremely bad. It gives you a growth rate of about log log x. The number of primes up to x is about x over log x. Now, how many of you have seen this proof before? Okay. Now, related to this is one of the most interesting sequences in all of mathematics. And if you can generate a term that's not already known, I will give you an A plus for this course and an A plus for all future courses that you will take with me. What do you think the chances are of solving this problem? They're not as good as zero, no. All right, so how many of you have seen the Euclid Mullen sequence? Anybody seen the Euclid Mullen sequence? You have. Yes, you have. Yeah, it's up on the board. So let's run through Euclid's method and see what we get. We start off with 2. All right? We add 1 to that, and we get, is 3 a prime not on our list? Yeah, let's write it down. Now we have 2 primes, 2 and 3. We multiply them together. We get 6, add 1, 7. <gasps> That's a new prime. It's not on our list. So at this point, we conjecture boldly that it will always generate prime numbers. All right, 7 times 3 times 2 is 42, plus 1 is 43. The conjecture is looking better and better. If you go the next step, however, you get a number that's composite. And then there's a couple of ways to continue the game. What you can do is you can take the smallest prime that divides your next number, and that's the next term of the sequence, or you can just say, let's just take all the primes that divide my number and put them in as the next couple of terms that aren't already on the list. The standard method is you just take the smallest one and continue. So the next one you would get would be 13. And I've written it over here. Then it is 53, 5, and then 6, 2, 2, 1, 6, 7, 1. So you can see nice, interesting in terms of change of size. Then after that, 3, 8, 7, 0, 9, 1, 8, 3, 8, 1, 0, 5, 7, 1. And then I love what comes next. Then 139, 28, 0, 1, 11, and I'll end with 17. And the list goes on and on and on. And there's a lot of questions you could ask. What's a question you could ask about this sequence? Will it eventually generate all the primes? If you prove that, I'll even give you a PhD from Princeton. I still have contacts there. I can easily call someone up and say, done. And this is being recorded. Great question. We don't know. You could ask, what factor of the primes does it generate? Are there anything special of the primes that it misses? How long do you have to wait till you get to a specific prime? Yeah, I like, my son and I love the number 17. 
you know, we got it fairly quickly. What if you liked 23 instead? Do we have any idea of how long you have to wait for a certain prime? So there's a lot of great questions you can ask about this sequence. This is a finite problem, right? Theoretically, is there any difficulty in generating the next term? No. Multiply all the numbers and then just check every number up until that number and see if it works. Right? So this gives us an opportunity to talk about algorithms. And you know, can we come up with better you know, sequence of algorithms? Which ones are better than others? So I deliberately want you to give me bad answers now. I will be upset if you give me good, efficient methods for the first round. I want the worst possible thing you can think of. Right? So I want algorithms to factor. So let's say you want to factor x. How could you factor x? Check every number of undergrads. OK, good. Check from 1 to x. Beautiful. How long will this take? Well, depending on how large x is, then you have to take into account maybe certain multiplications and divisions are harder than others. So but let's ignore that. We'll say it takes x steps. So the cost is x. What's the weakest tweak you could do that's a little bit better? No, 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 no. no. That's all right. Please. That's all right. Two through x. I'm sorry? Take all the way. The other multiples say two. Very close. So how high do I have to check? Check up to? Get rid of 1 minus x. Or I'm sorry, x minus 1. You could do x minus 1. Um, given that I'm asking for smart asses, I can't really be upset with that. Can you be a little bit less of a smart ass? X over two, thank you. Check from one to X over two, the cost is X times. So you just saved 50%. If you could save you know, a company 50% you know, of its cost, usually that's great. You know, if X is of size 10 to the 400, which is what happens in applications, you go from a cost of 10 to the 400 to five times 10 to the 399 which is still well beyond anything you can do. But it's better. You know, there were suggestions, you know, look at, instead of just checking all the x's, you know, we don't have to check multiples of two. So we could do some savings like that. How high do we need to check up to? Square root of x. OK, so. So if x equals m times n, and m and n are both strictly less than square root of n, then m times n is less than, I'm sorry, less than x, square root of x, then m times n is less than x. So now the cost is the square root of x. That's a real savings now. You could do something even better. Yes? Just the primes. Just the primes. Now, unfortunately, that doesn't save you that much. The cost is approximately the square root of x over log square root of x. So you save basically a logarithm. This is going to be roughly 2 square root of x over log x. And there's a problem with this. What would be the problem with using this? Yes? You need to know all of those primes. You need to know all the primes. So you would have to store them. And so unfortunately, for some problems, it's actually easier not to store things and just do the calculation again. So I really want you to be aware of stuff like this. I'm not just doing number theory because I like number theory. I think there's a lot of good lessons we can learn from a problem like this. As a theorist, factorization is trivial. You know, we have an algorithm that works, and we have several refinements. But none of these are good enough for factorization to be practical. There may be a practical way to factor. It has not been publicly disclosed. Who might know such a way? The government, the NSA, might know such a way. And if they did, they would not announce. And 
there are, I'll save those stories until we have an equipment malfunction. So, I will say I once took a class from somebody from the NSA, and he got to do something that as a professor, you can only dream of doing. When he was asked questions, he would say, I cannot comment. He would go, can you, no, 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 I am legally not allowed to say anything other than I cannot comment, because if I say anything else, you may be able to glean some information about what I do and do not know based on how I'm not answering your question. It's a very interesting lecture. So just because something is finite and doable, or it's finite and doable theoretically, doesn't mean it's doable practically. So what I want to do now is I want to talk a little bit about where things are going. So I want to talk a little bit about the simplex method. And this is going to be what will make linear programming usable for us, is it's going to run in a reasonable amount of time. So the simplex method has two steps, or we call them phases. Phase one is to find a feasible solution or prove none exist. Phase two is a little bit more involved, but it's not terrible. Given a feasible solution, find an optimal solution, or prove none exist by, constru by constructing a sequence of feasible solutions with cost going to negative infinity. So this is the simplex method. I have not said how to do this. I've just said these are the two phases. Phase one is to find a basic feasible solution. Step two, phase two, is given a feasible solution, find an optimal or prove that an optimal doesn't exist. Now, if we have a feasible solution, we always have a basic feasible solution. And so the idea would be to very quickly pass the basic stuff. So here is the proof, or I'll do proof outline. Okay, assume you can do phase two. Show this implies can do phase one. Okay, so we will start off by you know, assuming we know how to do phase two, and from that we will be able to do phase one. And then the second step, assume you can do phase one, show this implies can do phase two. Right? So first we assume we can do phase two until we can do phase one, and then we assume we can do phase one and we get phase two. Any concerns about this? Okay, the iPad just nodded. Yes. Yes. So embrace the circle. It does look like a circular proof. It's not but it's not for a very subtle reason. Yes? Is it because you can also prove that the optimal solution doesn't exist? Nope, but not a bad try. Imagine you own American Airlines, okay? What is your objective? Make money. To make money. Imagine you own a movie theater, what is your objective? Make money. Right. Imagine you're teaching a operations research class. What is your objective? 
<laughs> I was wondering if I was going to put it in the same half. Okay, so should we have a grades? No, we won't have a grades deal on the board. Okay, so it's not always the answer. The goal is to make money. Uh, my freshman physics professor said, I can't believe people pay me to do physics. You know, that's how much you love the subject. This is one of the joys of being a student, I think, at a place like Williams College. You have people who want to be here teaching. I have been at schools where office hours were 8.30 a.m. the day after homework was due. Or they would have to list who's teaching the class as staff, because if they actually said who was teaching it, no one would sign up. So make money is usually the answer in any question of operations research involving companies. How does American Airlines make money? Offering flights. How does a movie theater make money? Concessions. Concessions. Uh, they actually make more money from concessions than they do from actually showing the movies in many situations. So, oh dear God, um, I'm just trying to imagine how old you are. Were you alive when The Phantom Menace came out? It was later than 97. I, I was a grad yeah, student in Princeton. It was later than 97 than some of us were. Okay, so then there's a chance that some of you were not alive when The Phantom Menace came out. So this was the first Star Wars movie in well over a decade. You know, we didn't know at the time, but we were excited. Okay, and I actually arranged with Princeton University, uh, we had a deal with a local movie theater where we could get 300 advanced tickets. We just had to have one person in mind for every 10 tickets we bought, and we had a massive party. George Lucas had some severe conditions for any theater that was going to show The Phantom Menace. It had to be on your biggest screen, the sound system had to be at least a certain level, or you would not be able to appreciate the subtleties of Jar Jar. <laughs> and a lot of people said, yeah, so we'll do it, we'll do it, we want Phantom Menace. And a couple of other theaters said, no. We'll let the other people split the demand for The Phantom Menace, because not only do they have to use their biggest screen, and not only do they have to have a sound system at a certain level, which might require an upgrade, which could be useful for later, but they had to commit to showing it for a certain number of weeks. And the way the contracts work is the longer a movie's been out, the more sheer the theater typically gets from the, cons from the ticket sales. But for most movies, what happens the longer it's out? The less people want to see it. So typically, the demand goes down the longer it's out, and you get a higher and higher percent of a smaller and smaller number. Now, movies like The Blair Witch Project are wonderful because they actually have an inverse demand where it's this word of mouth, hey, you gotta see this. But for a lot of things, the movie theaters make more money from concessions. And this is why, especially in hot climates, they will often show old movies for a buck or sometimes even free. They just want you inside, oh, it's an air conditioned day, let's go to the theater, and buying the reasonably priced popcorn and the moderately priced soda, you know, stuff like that. So let's say you own a movie theater and you want to come up with a feasible solution and then you want to go from that to an optimal solution to maximize your revenue. And you've got different constraints. And I've actually worked, I will share the paper with you. You might not want to have too many movies getting out at the same time because then you'll have a crowd rush. You might not want to have too many movies starting at the same time because you'll then have too many people trying to buy tickets at the same time. You can't use one screen to show two movies at the same time. Can you give me a simple rule that will guarantee a feasible scheduling of movies? Don't schedule any movies. Don't schedule any movies. A feasible solution exists. Can you give me a feasible solution for American Airlines? Ground all planes. Uh, that's actually pronounced United, but yes, that works. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that this is being recorded. Uh, I will now mention and give a shout out to the wonderful song United Breaks Guitars. If you oh. have not heard that, I will send a link. It is a fabulous song. And I have corresponded with the author of that song and shared my experiences. If there's ever a version four, I think he might consider incorporating some of my stories from Halifax <laughs> to New York. Feasible solutions sometimes are easy to find. Now, we say assume you can do phase two. This is the genius. So this implies you can do phase one. For phase two, we need a feasible solution. 
what I can often do is I give you a linear programming problem and you find a related linear programming problem where there is a solution that is screaming at you, hey, I'm feasible. And then you have the input to run phase two. So what you do is you actually have two different linear programming problems and you play one off the other. So given a linear programming problem, you find an associated linear programming problem where it is trivial <coughs> to find a feasible solution. For certain things in the real world, it's not hard to come up with a feasible solution. Fly no planes, show no movies, right? This is not a problem. Then once you have that, then you have a feasible solution to begin with. And then you start saying, well, I now want to start actually having this thing called profit. And you know, what do I do to actually get that profit? When we were working with the movie industry, we were working with a theater in the Netherlands. And we had two hours from when we got the list of movies to when we had to give them the schedule because they had to make the deadlines for these things called newspapers. This was done a while ago. And there was one constraint that was killing us, is the owner of the theater or the manager of the theater wanted a movie to start every 20 minutes so that nobody would have a very long line. Now, in 21st century America now, how many of you just show up at a movie theater eh, just, just without checking in advance? Right. So a lot of us didn't really think this was a big concern. But the manager wanted that constraint. And keeping that constraint was really slowing down the problem and really affecting the optimal solution we were able to do. Eventually, this leads to different types of constraints. There are some constraints that are hard constraints. You have to have. Give me a hard constraint for movie theater. Something that must be true. Can't show more movies on screens. Can't show more movies on screens. You can't show a movie on two screens simultaneously unless you buy two copies. You know, there's a couple of hard constraints. Like, give me a hard constraint for an airline. Can't blow up more seats than you have. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm not sure if this was her. Uh, the suggestion from class was you can't book more seats than you have. One would think that that is a hard constraint, but it is not. And in fact, this allows us to circle back to United, where they had that wonderful situation where they had a plane that was oversold, and people had already boarded the plane, and they told a specific individual, you're not going to be on this flight anymore. And people had, I think, cell phones that could record the person being escorted off the planes. And what is the solution in a situation like that when you need someone to get off the plane? You bribe them. You bribe them. You know, we need a volunteer. Anybody willing to get off for five bucks? Probably not. I think you start moving it up until you get to a certain point. When I was young, my family was going to California to visit some relatives. And the plane was overbooked. We were already sitting down, and they needed more seats. And they said, we will give two free round-trip tickets, plus a night in a hotel, plus a meal allowance. I've never seen my father run faster. You <laughs> had done it. He got it. And the next day, you were flying out, and they are overbooked again. My, my dad and I were like, let's do it. And my mother and my brother were like, yeah, we're going to California. And it's like, but we'll get another vacation out of this. Come on. And so you know, in the end, you know, we weren't willing as a family unit to do it again. But the price was so high that, oh, yeah, we'll take it. And not only will we take it, what will we be? Satisfied, more than satisfied. You know, we're going to be happy. We're going to have a positive experience and a positive memory from United. So you take a situation where you could have created somebody who would have been grateful, loyal, whatever, and instead <laughs> you have this huge fiasco that erupts over social media and has a huge financial impact on the airlines. So you want to get a sense of which constraints do you have to include and have to satisfy, and which constraints would just be nice. And so when we were doing this project, we actually moved some constraints from hard constraints that had to be satisfied to you could violate them by a certain amount, but there's a cost. So if there wasn't a movie starting within 20 minutes, you had this extra cost. And when we showed them how much more money they could make, he said, well, that was more of a suggestion. All right, so that's a good place to end.